So let's look at congenital toxoplasmosis. And um, first of all, let's say that uh, congenital toxoplasmosis belong into a group of diseases that we call uh, TOCH. We use an acronym called TOCH to try to describe those uh, diseases. And uh, it's a list of five infections initially. So TOCH is an acronym, as you can see here, T for toxoplasmosis, O for other infection like syphilis, congenital syphilis, congenital toxo, congenital syphilis, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes simplex virus. So we have a list of uh, those diseases that we will uh, discuss through different lectures. Now, those diseases were put together initially because they have some similarities in terms of their clinical findings, especially that they, most of them, they all affect the eyes. So there are ocular uh, clinical presentations and they also can give a rash, you know, skin rash on the body. That's why they were grouped together. And uh, in terms of the route of uh, transmission for those uh, the different infections, you will see that four out of the five uh, of these infections are transmitted transplacentally. It means that uh, through the placenta, you know, when you have a pregnant woman and uh, the infection can be transmitted from the mother to unborn child via the placenta. And we have uh, syphilis can also be transmitted uh, intravaginally, so or pervaginally. It means that uh, uh, when the child is coming out um, during birth through the vagina, passing through the vaginal canal, then uh, that child can become infected. It's the same uh, for herpes simplex virus that you can, the baby can also contract when passing through uh, the vaginal canal during birth. Now, this part one of uh, this lecture will uh, mainly focus on uh, congenital toxoplasmosis. We will only look at uh, a condition called toxoplasmosis. And uh, this is caused by a parasite called toxoplasma gondii, toxoplasma gondii. But the main player for the, the, this condition is the cat. So the cat is the main player in the transmission of this condition. That's, what, that's why we have the question, should I get rid of my cat? So we will see. Um, if you stick with this lecture, you will understand uh, the answer, if should I get rid or not of my cat. Now, let's look at the life cycle and the epidemiology of uh, this condition called toxoplasmosis. Now, the key player we said is the cat. So the cat is actually known as the definitive host, the definitive host for this parasite. All other animals, rodent, other domesticated animals or the human host are all intermediate, inter, inter, uh, intermediate host. They are all intermediate host. But the cat is the definitive host. So it's the cat that carries the parasite and the parasite will replicate in the intestinal mucosa of the cat, releasing the oocyst. The oocyst are um, uh, the unsporulated, what we call, they excrete the oocyst into their feces. So the cat will then excrete the oocyst into their feces, and then that will, the feces of the cat will then contaminate uh, the plant into the gardens or vegetables, uh, or maybe the cat lighter box will also be contaminated. Now, the main thing here is that, let's say that you, are, you have a small garden in the house and these plants are contaminated and you have rodent or bed who will come around here, they can become uh, contaminated uh, with the parasite. Then if the cat 
through the process of hunting, uh, be able to eat one of the rodents, the infection will then continue within the cat. So the cat will keep on being reinfected or new cats can become also infected, okay? But then if other animals who will come to eat um, or pass by or eat some of the, uh, the plants or vegetables or whatever, they will come into contact with uh, uh, the parasite. Then in the parasite, inside uh, their body, the parasite will develop what we call a bradyzoid. Bradyzoid is like a dormant stage of the oocyst you know, that will lodge into the muscle of the animals. So when you kill the animal for the purpose of extracting meat for eating, then you can eat the bradyzoid, you know, especially if you eat uncooked meat or meat that is not well cooked meat, so you can then be exposed to bradyzoid. Now, this oocyst released through the cat's uh, feces can also contaminate vegetables that can be, uh, they, they can, someone can sell the vegetables to you or you can have vegetables directly from uh, your garden. And if you don't properly wash these vegetables, actually uh, it is contaminated with the oocyst. There is a, uh, the form of oocyst that resist into the environment that we call sporozoids. Sporozoids will contaminate vegetables. And if you don't wash properly your vegetables, you will then become exposed to it. You will eat it. Then since this is an inactivated resistant form of the oocyst in your body, it will then reactivate and becomes a tachyzoid during a inactive replication. So the tachyzoid will then cause infection in your body. And if you happen to be pregnant, and this is very critical for pregnant women, then that tachyzoid will then pass through the placenta to go and infect your unborn baby. So your child will then be born with a disease that we call congenital toxoplasmosis. Congenital toxoplasmosis. And uh, so this is what the cyst, the all cyst or the cyst looks like. And this, if you eat uh, meat that is uh, not well cooked or it's uncooked, then this all cyst from uh, Toxoplasma gondii is what will be in the muscle, you know, in the meat, inside the meat. So that's what you will eat as a bradyzoid, and this bradyzoid into your stomach will reactivate. It will become tachyzoid, then it will move into different organs of your body, and it can go to the brain, it can go into your eye, it can go, and if it happens that you are a pregnant woman, it will pass through the placenta and go and infect your unborn child. Now, the question is, should you get rid of your cat because the cat is the major key player. All right, now, so I say that Toxoplasma gondii life cycle has three stages. We say that the active acute stage of the parasite, the parasite is called the tachyzoid because that is uh, the form of the parasite that is able to invade uh, the cells or the organs of your body and being able to replicate. So it is the, the stage of the parasite that is responsible for congenital infections. And the second stage is the other stage is bradyzoid. Bradyzoid is what we found during latent infection. So if the cyst that you just find into the muscles, it stays there dormant. And if it's an animal, when you kill the animal, you extract the meat. If the meat is not well cooked, then you will eat, ingest the bradyzoid. Then the bradyzoid will activate to tachyzoid. Then you have an active infection. Or we have another stage of the parasite that stays in the environment, stand uh, difficult environmental conditions, survive, contaminate food, contaminate vegetables. And if 
you eat vegetables that are not well washed, then you eat the sporozoid in your vegetables. So you can then uh, become sick. So in conclusion, Toxoplasma gondii is then transmitted to humans by different roads. We spoke by eating raw or inadequately cooked infected meat or by, ingested, by ingesting oocysts that cat have passed in their feces, you know, or women can transmit the infection transplantally to their unborn fetus. And this is the focus of this lecture because we are mainly going to discuss congenital toxoplasmosis, so the infection of the unborn fetus, the unborn child, or when they are born, they develop that infection that they acquired transplanted. Okay, so what are the, um, the types and uh, risk for this mother to child uh, transmission of uh, congenital toxoplasmosis? Classically, congenital infection results from primary acquired maternal infection. So it means that you have a mother, a woman, who, who is pregnant and who will acquire the infection for the very first time during pregnancy, you know? So it's what we call a primary acquired maternal infection. And that infection is then able to be passed into the unborn child, you know? So this is one way of, or the other way is that you have a mother who has been infected a long time prior to pregnancy and was having a parasite at a dormant stage in uh, her different organs. And now, uh, maybe because of some reason, uh, mainly HIV infection, there is a reactivation of that past infection during pregnancy, and the mother will now be able to infect the baby. Or it can be a reinfection of a previously immune pregnant mother. So she could have been having another a previous infection, but now she was cured or became immune. Then now it's a reinfection with a different strain of the parasite. You know? But the most important thing is that the frequency of vertical transmission and the severity, vertical transmission is a transmission that happens from a mother to the unborn child. So the frequency of the vertical transmission and the severity of the fetal damage, of the damage that we see in the child depend on the stage of the pregnancy, you know? So the complications depend at which stage of the pregnancy the mother was exposed to the parasite, to the parasite because of the cat, you know? So we will see on this table is that uh, if you are inf the mother is infected at 13 weeks or 26 weeks or 36 weeks, you know, at a different age of pregnancy, the risk increases with age. So the risk of developing of the, 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 the child, you know, being uh, infected, the risk of congenital infection from occurring increases with the age of pregnancy. Now, why should the risk increases with the age of pregnancy? We will see that on the next slide. And, but there is an inverse relationship with the clinical manifestation. So if the child is infected early, that child will be born with a lot of clinical manifestation. If, if as compared to the child who is infected late, the risk is low, you know? It means that that child will may be born asymptomatic. So what I'm saying is that the risk of developing an infection increases with the age of pregnancy. So the woman who contracts pregnancy at 13 weeks will have a risk of six, is six times higher able to develop, uh, to have her baby developing a congenital infection. But if the infection happened at 26 weeks pregnancy, the risk is 40 times higher. At 36, the risk is 72 times higher of the unborn child developing toxoplasmosis, congenital toxoplasmosis. Why is increasing with 
the age of pregnancy, it's because of the permeability of the placenta as the pregnancy progresses. So at the beginning of the pregnancy, the placenta is much more protective against this parasite. But as the pregnancy progresses, the placenta is becoming more permeable, allowing the parasite to pass through and to infect the baby. So if you are exposed to the parasite, you are pregnant, you are exposed to the parasite at six weeks, there is a very high risk of your baby being infected. But this, it's in opposition to the risk of developing an infection. So if you are exposed early with the parasite, it means that there is a high chance for your baby to be born with uh, a lot of clinical manifestation because the baby will be exposed for a very long time. Uh, as compared to if you are exposed late, the mother is exposed late, then there is a high chance that the baby, few babies will be born with symptoms, most of them, will be asymptomatic. So this is what I was saying is that the placenta plays a main role in the process. So as it is both a natural barrier, which is supposed to protect the fetus and a target tissue for the parasite multiplication. So the placental barrier is more efficient at the beginning. And uh, when the pregnancy progresses, the placenta will become more permeable, allowing the parasite to pass through and cause an infection. So you will see that the placenta becomes more permeable throughout pregnancy. And uh, you will see 30% of uh, cases uh, take place if the pregnant woman is exposed with the parasite in the second semester, trimester of uh, pregnancy. And 60 to 70% if the mother is exposed in the last trimester of pregnancy because the placenta becomes highly permeable. So the severity of fetal infection is inversely correlated. Since neonates are asymptomatic in more than 80% of cases when the infection takes place in the last trimester of pregnancy. This is what I explained already. Now let's look at the pathogenesis of uh, this condition. So, when transplacental transmission occurs during the first trimester, consequences to the fetus are very heavy because the fetus will have a long period of exposure with the parasite. So the fetus will be exposed for a very long time and as a result, the fetus will be heavily damaged. So there will be a lot of consequences to the fetus. You know, a lot of the child will be born with a lot of abnormalities. So parasite multiplication will then induce necrosis and that will lead to strong inflammation and major abnormalities, especially in the child's brain and the eyes. You know, the child will be born with a lot of abnormalities. The brain and the eyes are the two organs that are heavily affected, you know, with this congenital infection. So in the brain, we will also have a blockage of the aqueduct of Sylvius, that is a place where the CSF used to pass. You know, that will be blocked. You will have accumulation of the fluid, uh, and that will lead to hydrocephalus, especially of the lateral ventricles will be affected in the brain. And we will just see that. We will see that in the next slide. So you will then have a calcification in the brain. The child will have calcification in the brain. You will have also um, hydrocephalus that you can see when you look at the CT of the brain. So we can do either transfrontanella echography or we can do a CT scan of the brain. You know, like in this case, you will see that this is a non-contrast CT scan um, image that will show here you will see this is a calcification, you know, here, this white spot, it's uh, what we call uh, calcification. Uh, we found the calcification here in the right frontal subcortical white matter. And also we see other calcification here, you know, in the left thalamus, we see calcification here. So this is what you can see in the brain 
of the child when he is born. Um, those are calcification that you can see. And here also, there is a pre-contrast CT and post-contrast CT that will show you actually uh, a solitary mass. You can see a mass here uh, in the post-contrast. But in the pre-contrast, you can see also this mass is there. You know. So we have a mass. It's a single mass that you can see in the left thalamus that is centrally hypoattenuating and, uh, you know, uh, there is a vasogenic edema around, the vasogenic edema around the mass. So that's what you can see in the CT scan of the brain, you know, with or without contrast, you can be able to see this image. Now, what are the factors, the risk factors associated with increased risk of a mother to child uh, transmission of uh, congenital uh, toxoplasmosis. The first thing is that uh, if the infection happens during pregnancy, so if the infection happens, the pregnant mother gets the infection during pregnancy, it's a high risk. Or if the mother is immunocompromised, let's say in many cases we have HIV infected mothers or mothers who are taking corticosteroid for a long time or those who are on chemotherapy and any other things that will reduce the uh, immune system of the mother you know will lead uh, to the risk of developing congenital toxoplasmosis you know and if the diagnosis is not made earlier let's say before that the child is born you know, we need to diagnose this condition in itero, you know, before that the child is born so that uh, the mother can start taking treatment to reduce, you know, the abnormalities of the child. It also depends on the virulence of uh, Toxoplasma gondii strain because we have different strains and they have, of the parasite, they have different levels of uh, virulence. And it depends also on the high parasite load means that uh, how many parasites have you acquired being exposed to and how it will replicate, you know, it will also lead to numerous conditions. Now, the diagnosis can be done during pregnancy and this is what we need to aim for, to do a diagnosis during pregnancy uh, while trying to limit, you know, the, uh, the challenges. So, we will then request the, um, the mother to do a serology test. The pregnant woman can do a serology test and we will look for IgG and IgM uh, for toxoplasmosis. So if IgG and IgM are negative, it means that uh, there was no prior infection. Uh, the mother did, was not uh, infected prior to, uh, to, to pregnancy. And, but we can retest just to ensure that there is no seroconversion later on in the case the woman acquired primary infection during pregnancy, you know. So, but if IgG is positive, we, we think the IgG is the antibody G is positive, but the IgM is negative. And you have this, this test took place uh, before 18 weeks of pregnancy, before 18 weeks of pregnancy, it means that the infection was high likely acquired prior to pregnancy. Remember that IgG, it's a marker of an old infection. IgM is a marker of a new, a recent infection. Now, if IgM is negative and the IgG is positive and the test was done before that the mother uh, reaches uh, 18 weeks, uh, become being 18 weeks pregnant, it is high likely that this infection took place before that she becomes pregnant, you know? And here the risk is uh, of baby becoming infected, it's uh, less, the risk is very less. So uh, the CT is almost zero unless the woman is immunocompromised, you know? But if this happens, uh, if the test is done uh, after 18 weeks of gestation, it is difficult to estimate when the woman was infected, but you can screen further. But it is high likely that she could have been infected 
during pregnancy and the risk will then be very high. So we can see here, if IgG, remember IgG is a marker of past infection, IgM is a marker of new infection. So if all IgG and IgM are negative, so there is no serological evidence of uh, any infection, you know, so we can just do follow-up tests to try to see if there is no new seroconversion, you know, later on. But if IgG is positive and IgM is negative, we check if this test was done before 18 weeks uh, of gestation, then it means that the risk is low. But if it's done after 18 weeks, uh, it is uncertain. We don't know when exactly the woman was, the pregnant woman was exposed, but it might be that she has been exposed during pregnancy. We have to repeat the test again. But if, uh, um, uh, if both IgG and IgM are positive, then it is a confirmation of uh, the current infection. It means that this woman has been exposed to the parasite recently. So um, the prenatal diagnosis and follow-up. So we say that uh, when a maternal infection acquired during pregnancy is clearly established, or we highly suspect that uh, there is an infection during pregnancy, we have to immediately treat the mother with a sp uh, a spiramycin, we use a spiramycin until delivery, and we propose then a prenatal diagnosis. So we start the mother, the pregnant woman, on treatment using spiramycin. We can also do ultrasound surveillance. So we can keep on doing ultrasound to check uh, if the baby is developing uh, a lot of abnormalities or not, you know, to try to monitor if there is a need, you know, for you know, stopping pregnancy or not. So we can uh, do, we can monitor pregnancy doing uh, ultrasound. And we can also collect uh, amniotic fluid. We can, uh, you know, uh, using uh, uh, ultrasound guidance, we can, uh, during pregnancy, we can collect some fluid or doing a puncture. It's performed especially after 16 weeks of uh, pregnancy and at least four weeks after maternal infection, you know, we can uh, try to test the amniotic fluid. We can do PCR to try to, uh, so we do molecular tests called PCR to try to, to look at the, par the DNA of the parasite and be able to, to make uh, the diagnosis, you know, before birth. Now, after the child um, is born, so, postnatal diagnosis of congenital, we, we have to do a follow-up protocol for the newborn. So at birth first, we need to do a complete clinical and uh, neurological uh, investigation of the child. We will do a transfrontal ultrasound examination. We can do that or we can do a CT scan uh, as I showed you the images. We can also do a ocular uh, exam so we have uh, to to perform uh, an examination of the eye to try to see if uh, there are no uh, eye manifestations. So we need to do a detailed physical examination of the, the child when he's born. We need to do a detailed neurologic evaluation. We need to do ophthalmologic examination to check the eye. We need to check the brainstem auditory system to see if the child is able to hear. We need to do a CT scan of the brain, or we can do uh, ultrasonography. We can do abdominal ultrasound. We can do serial IgG antibody titles every four to six weeks. So we need a strong follow-up of uh, that child when he is born. Now let's look at the clinical manifestation. Now the clinical manifestation, the most important to remember is to look for hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is the most important one. We can have all other ranges of uh, clinical manifestation, but hydrocephalus is the most common. And in the eye examination, we can uh, see signs of uh, chorioretinitis, you know, that might lead to blindness when the child starts growing, so chorioretinitis. 
And uh, we can also see cerebral calcification when we do the CT scan. So those are the most important signs. I have shown you the calcification on uh, CT scan. Now here it's uh, different uh, uh, images of hydrocephalus. You will see here. Um, here you will see hydrocephalus that is involving uh, uh, the lateral and the third ventricles. So lateral and third ventricles are affected. You will see here on a CT scan. And um, here you will see that uh, there is an obstruction on, of the foramen of Moro that is uh, 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 affected here. And here you will see a unilateral foramenal obstruction that will lead to unilateral hydrocephalus. And here you will see bilateral uh, ventricular dilation you know, with uh, the normal third and fourth ventricles uh, are normal. So you can see uh, those are different images of uh, hydrocephalus. Then when you do AI investigations, you can, depending on the stage of the infection, if the patient, the child is having an active infection, you will have kind of these white spots you know, on uh, when you do, you, use, uh, you do ophthalmoscopy, so you will see kind of white spots in the retina. And it usually causes the eye to fill with white cells, making the vision cloudy, you know. And in most cases, chorioretinitis, because chorioretinitis is a recurrent infection, it will lead to the formation of scars. You know, here you have black scars, you know, it's... Uh, uh, recurrent infection, previous infection, you will have uh, another inflammation, a recurrent inflammation, and uh, with a tissue destruction, so you will have a formation of the scar. You know, so you can either see the white spot or you can see if it's an old infection, the baby was exposed for a long time, you can see those black uh, scars. You can be able to see. So, there are two complementary strategies to confirm the congenital toxoplasmosis at delivery. The first one is that the parasite detection in the placenta. You can do the detection of uh, parasite in the placenta. When the child is born, we can take the placenta, uh, take a tissue, do a biopsy, and send to the lab. We can find the parasite. Or you can uh, also use the cord blood, you know, serum for... Uh, extract the blood from the umbilical cord, and we can then do, um, we, we, can, we can also test that. We can do DNA detection using PCR. So we can also do serological analysis of the neonate serum with the aim of demonstrating the presence of specific antibodies, which will be evidence of a in vitro infection. So we can also check antibodies in the neonate serum. So the cold, the cold blood serum is recovered and serologic testing of the neonate can be repeated at one month of life and then every two or three months to monitor if there will be a decrease in the level of maternally transmitted antibodies, which usually disappear within five to eight months. So it means that if you collect blood from uh, the umbilical cord, then or you, 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 you then also check blood from the neonet and you measure the antibodies. You start repeating that test. You know, if it was antibodies that came from the mother, the level of antibodies will decrease over time until they will completely disappear after five to eight months, uh, you know, of age of the baby. But if it was a real, a true infection in the baby, the level of antibodies will not decrease, but it will uh, increase to show that it's an infection that is there, that is established. So the detection of specific IgM, remember IgM, I say it's a marker of uh, a recent a new infection, which cannot cross the placental barrier is a key marker of fetal infection. And this is crucial because the IgG can cross the placenta from mother to the child, but the IgM is a very large molecule. 
it cannot cross the placenta. So if you do serology in the child, in the born child, and you find the presence of IgM, it's a confirmation that the child is indeed infected. But if you only find IgG positive, IgM negative, that IgG might come from the mother. And when you repeat the test over time, you will see that the level, the titer of that IgG will be decreasing over time. You know, so as maternal IgG is passively transferred in utero, the simple quantitative assay is of no help in the diagnosis of fetal infection, but at least we will see if the amount of uh, antibodies is decreasing. Now, so persistence of positive toxo IgG antibodies beyond 12 months of age is the gold standard for making the diagnosis of congenital toxoplasmosis, because we know that the IgG is coming from the mother much more often. So if we say that if you find IgM, you make the diagnosis, because IgM cannot come from the mother, because it's a large molecule. But if you find IgG, it might come from the mother. But if the IgG is persistent beyond 12 months of age, is indeed a confirmation that you are dealing with a case of congenital toxoplasmosis. So the test to confirm it's either persistent IgG or presence of IgM, or maybe doing PCR from amniotic fluid or CSF of the child or peripheral blood or urine or any other body fluid from the child doing molecular tests can confirm the diagnosis. You know, so this is what we are saying now. Approaches to prevention and control. How do we prevent this from happening? You know, first, screening and treatment of pregnant women to reduce parasites. But before this, we say that pregnant women should stay away from cats or maybe try to clean the cat lighter box or, you know, try to be in contact with anything. They need to wash the vegetables, you know, very well before cooking it. They need to cook their meat properly and so on to try as much as possible to avoid contact with the parasites. So we are not requesting that uh, you get rid of your cat, but you need to stay away from the cat and possible contamination. You need to wash the vegetables. You need to cook well your meat before eating it, okay? Then after that, if you become pregnant, if you suspect that you have been exposed with your cat or parasite or whatever, you suspect anything, we need to do screening and treatment of pregnant women to reduce the risk of parasite transmission. So what we are saying is that serological screening of pregnant women is not the rule and differs among countries according to the prevalence of toxo. So in the absence of screening, hygienic measures are the keystone of prevention and should be largely disseminated to pregnant women. And pyramidin can be used for primary prevention of congenital toxoplasmosis, but we can also use that in combination with a cotrimoxazole, uh, pyrametamine, sulfonamide, in association with folic acid, you know, can also be used after the first trimester of pregnancy. Remember, after the first trimester of pregnancy, the risk of transmission is very high because of the permeability of the placenta to allow the parasites to go through. So prenatal screening and treatment to limit fetal damage. We, when the child is born, we have to do you know, the, the, the screening as well. And uh, we can also know prenatal before the child is born and postnatal after the child is born, we also say that we need uh, to screen the child, you know, clinical screening, uh, ophthalmic examination, CT of the brain, CT of the abdomen. We need to do, you know, a lot of investigation to, to try to, to make the diagnosis. Now, the last thing is screening and uh, chemoprophylaxis of toxo in immunocompromised patients. Remember, we spoke about primary versus secondary prophylaxis. So primary prevention aims to screen targeted patients to identify those who are at risk of acquiring a primary toxoplasma infection, either naturally, 
you know, like transplant, uh, during transplantation of organ from a seropositive donor, which can be prevented by chemoprophylaxis, that can be done. Or secondary prevention relies on chemoprophylaxis and concern in immunocompromised patients who are seropositive, who have already acquired infection in distant past and are likely to reactivate. So what I'm saying is that when you are pregnant, we need to know. We need to know it's either if you, if there is a, an, a, a, an information or there is a possibility of a risk for you becoming infected, you know, we can put you on what we call primary prevention. So we can put you on treatment to prevent that you should not develop toxoplasmosis so that you cannot transfer that to your unborn child. You know, but if you have been infected with toxoplasmosis in the past, we need to look at, we can also try to avoid reactivation of that infection, especially if you are on any treatment that can reduce your immune system or if you are found to be HIV positive, that will reduce your immune system. So we can try to avoid that. We can put you on secondary prevention. Secondary prevention will help you to, to prevent from reactivation of uh, the infection. So as for congenital toxoplasmosis, there is no consensus about serologic screening for immunodeficient patients, except in the case of a, one set of clinical manifestations suggesting a volatile toxoplasmosis. So um, this was uh, um, our lecture on uh, congenital toxoplasmosis. I, uh, I think you can send your questions or comments, you know, leave your question or comment and uh, we will uh, reply to you. And uh, please don't forget to uh, follow another presentation on congenital syphilis that will come just after this. So we will speak about uh, the next lecture is about uh, congenital syphilis. Thank you very much. Bye bye for now.